Hi, I'm Will. I'm Norm. Norm, we're here at Reed College of Portland, Oregon. What are we doing at Reed College, Norm? This is the home of the Reed Research Reactor. Do you know what that is? It's a nuclear reactor? Yep. Oh. Run by undergraduates. Now, there are a bunch of research reactors in the United States, about 30 of them. They're op licensed to operate, but this is the only one that undergrads run. Would you have let me run a nuclear reactor when I was an undergraduate? I won't let you run one now. That's probably wise. Let's go check it out. First, we learned about nuclear fission. The basic concept is you've got uranium in the core, and uh, it's a fissile material. So when it gets hit by a neutron, we've got kind of a diagram here, uh, it's going to undergo fission and split into um, fragments that uh, have a lot of energy, and uh, it's also going to give off more neutrons, and then those neutrons are going to go off and repeat the process. And so you sort of you know, get an exponential increase in the number of fission events that are going on and that's how power actually increases. So that's why we have the control rods, which are made of uh, boron, which is a material that, you know, just uh, has a really high probability of capturing neutrons and preventing them from undergoing, f or uh, from causing fission. And so that's actually what we've got the buttons there for, is uh, they, they control um, the, uh, the height of the control rods, and so as we pull them in or out, we affect how much of the, uh, how many neutrons are going to get captured by the control rods, and we control how many are available for fission. Okay, so, so you're saying the reactor is controlled with six buttons? Yeah, yeah it's, it comes down to about those six buttons do most of the work. We have three up buttons and three down buttons, and those correspond to the three control rods, as you might think. Okay. The uh, up buttons move the control rods out of the core. That will mean there'll be less boron neutron poison in the core, and will allow us to go up in power. To tell what power at, I use these three different power channels. We have a logarithmic, a linear, and a percent power, and they essentially tell us how many neutrons are there. This bar right here is the scram bar, so if I press this button, it will um, re cut the power to the, all of the electromagnets and all three rods fall into the core at the same time. Oh, so there's not a separate scram pile that, or a scram bar that drops in. That button just drops all three of the, the rods all the way into the reactor yes. and shuts the whole thing down. Mm -hmm. yes. But we wondered why it was called a scram. Every reactor um, has an emergency shutdown, a way we can bring the reactor down to a very, very low power very quickly if there was some sort of emergency. So the very first reactor was built um, at the University of Chicago. Uh, underneath the squash courts. There was a labor strike, so that was the only place they could build it. Um, and it was called CP1, Chicago Pile 1, and it was a pile. Our reactor is very tiny, it's efficient, uh, we have a good design, we have a good understanding of the physics. They didn't know nearly as much, so they built their reactor by just piling up uranium and graphite, and just piling up bigger and bigger until it was uh, able to sustain a chain reaction. Seems kind of ill-advised. Even worse is their control rods were not operated by machines. Uh, they were operated by graduate students. Um, uh, Enrico Fermi and two of his graduate students who uh, were in charge of a lot of this. Um, was this part of the Manhattan Project? It was. It was at the beginning of the Manhattan Project. Okay. Uh, first step, build a reactor. Second uh, step, build a bomb. The whole reason a, a nuclear reactor works is you have a bunch of neutrons flying around and they hit uranium and the uranium fissions. Um, right, that, that means it makes two neutrons or 2.74 neutrons yeah, for every... It, it makes more neutrons which then go on to hit more uranium and you get a chain reaction. At Chicago Pile 1 they had control rods that came in from the side. You can think of a control rod like a neutron sponge. If it's in the core, it's absorbing neutrons. We pull it out, it's not absorbing neutrons, they can go on and create more fission. They would uh, do calculations and then push your control rod in like three inches and there was a, a ruler taped to the control rod and okay inserted three inches. Um, it was very primitive. And, and there's a graduate student attached yep. to the end of the control rod. Yep. This is not the most reliable way to control a reactor, especially if something goes wrong. Um, if for some reason the graduate students are, became incapacitated, like how do you shut it down? So they had another control rod that was suspended uh, by a, a rope um, and pulley from the ceiling and it just was sitting on top of the reactor like that. So they pulled the trigger and that dropped into the pile? The story is much better than that. Oh, so okay. it was tied off to um, a balcony and on the back balcony there was someone standing there, a distinguished phys physicist with a bunch of degrees after his name and he was holding an axe and his job if something terrible would happen was to cut that rope. Um, by cutting that rope he would drop the control rod in shutting down the nuclear reactor. <laughs> um, and so his job title was the safety control rod axe man. Safety control rod axe man scram. So an emergency shutdown at a nuclear reactor was called a scram. Because there was a guy with an axe There's standing a on a roof. Yeah, we 
Now at our facility, we are not fortunate enough to have axes and ropes. Um, we have electromagnets, so a magnet that works only when electricity is applied to it or going through it. Um, and so our control rods are held up by these electromagnets. And so we perform a scram by pushing a button that just cuts the power to that magnet. Um, once that happens, there's nothing holding our control rod up out of our core, and so it just drops in under the force of gravity. If I needed to communicate to the control room um, that there was something wrong and we needed to do an emergency shutdown, I would make this motion, okay. chopping an axe. Yeah. It's very hard to accidentally make that motion. <laughs> it's very hard to misinterpret it, and it has a cool story behind it. How quickly does the reactor shut down when the rods are completely inserted? This quickly. Oh wow, you weren't kidding. So what else are we looking at here on the control panel? There's some other buttons and, and uh, there's a computer up at the top and then there's a timer. Yes, so uh, start over here on the left we have um, these are tell you the position of each control rod. So this is how far it is out of the core. So each of the control rods are about 90% out of the core. Right now we're stable at 230 kilowatts, okay. which is the maximum power that we operate at. Um, and then also we measure pool temperature and pool level in millimeters. So we keep, so something we keep track of all the time. Like Austin was saying, we want to make sure the reactor doesn't get too hot. How hot is the water in the pool? It's 21.7 degrees right now. Celsius. Celsius, okay. yes. And how hot does the water in the pool get? We have our alarms at, th are at 35 degrees. Our limits are actually at 48.9 degrees, but we have alarms lower than that, obviously. Um, so we make sure we don't reach that point. And even there, the reactor would not be unsafe at all. Is there anything special about the water that's in the, in the tank? So it's not super special, but we do use deionized water uh, just so that it's very pure and there aren't any uh, isotopes in there that are going to end up getting activated. Uh, it helps keep overall radiation levels low. And, and how, how much water? Is it 25 feet deep, I think you said? Yeah, we have, we have uh, 25,000 gallons. gallons of water in there. So it's, it's a, a deceptively large tank. And, and is the water, is the, so because the water is just water, it's not going to get radiated? Right, yeah, it, it doesn't get super uh, exciting or anything like that. I mean, we always treat it as, you know, assuming that it could be contaminated, but in general, it's never very active. So could you go swimming in the pool? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I mean, it, so it's deionized water, which, you know, you wouldn't really want to be, like, hanging out with too much. Because deionized water is so pure and it doesn't have any solutes in it, it's just going to flow into any cells that it comes in contact with and that actually causes it to explode most of the cells that it comes in contact with. So deionized water is so clean that it's dangerous to the body. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, we like to tell people that it, it, the most dangerous part of the pool water is how clean it is. <laughs> I wanted to learn more about the captivating blue glow coming from the reactor. So I asked Ahmad Shabar, who is studying the glow for his senior thesis. Cherenkov radiation is produced when we go up to power, so what happens is like there's fission going on going on down over there. So when a neutron hits a uh, uranium atom, uranium atom, uranium atom splits up, fission fragments, and those fission fragments are very high like high energy, so they have to uh, go, go back down to like st st stable form as well. And they do that by emitting radiation, alphas, betas, and gammas, right? And, and those fission fragments are things like krypton and, and things like that? Cesium, xenon, samarium, krypton. There's over 400 like, different nuclei that, that, that like, are formed over there. So um, when that happens, when, when, when there's radiation, uh, fission fragments take most of the energy away, but there's about 8 MeV uh, beta particles coming out, coming out 8 MeV gamma uh, rays coming out. Okay. Those gamma rays then go on to cause uh, Compton scattering that emit like, m more electrons. Okay. Um, so the electrons and beta particles combined, they go on to cause Cherenkov radiation. And, and beta particles are just uh, electrons that... Yes, beta particles are just uh, electrons. They, they can also be uh, positrons as well, but like over, over there during beta decay, it's usually electrons that we're dealing with. Okay. So those neg negatively charged particles, they're traveling, they're actually traveling faster than the speed of light. That's because, uh, uh, speed of light underwater. In water, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's because underwater, uh, the speed slows down to three-fourths its, like, its, its original speed. Okay. So, um, so w when an electron passes by uh, a polar medium, like, like water, there's positive and negative end, uh, the positive end uh, f faces the direction of the electron and the negative end faces away. Okay. So when the electron goes further away, the uh, polarization like, is, is lost and the water molecules, uh, they, they face random directions like, again. So uh, when there's a changing electric field, there's a changing magnetic field, changing electric field, so there's a brief pulse of light. It's like a sonic boom. Light waves are trying to chase the electron 
and there's constructive interference, and that, because of that, we're able to see light further away. Okay, so this is what makes the reactor glow blue. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, otherwise, if they were uh, traveling slower than speed of light, we, we, we would not be able to see the light at all. Not everyone working in the Reed reactor is a scientist in training. So right now I'm actually um, I'm writing my thesis on data visualization and the, the art-science cooperation um, because art and science actually are really complementary fields. So um, what I'm working on right now is a chapter of my thesis that's on scientific illustration and the history of kind of how art has helped science to communicate some of its more complex ideas. So in studio art you write a paper and you create a project and so my paper is about science and art and data-driven art and the project that I'm making is actually based on this, um, this resource that we use here called the Chart of the Nuclides, which is like the periodic table, but exploded. Okay. Um, so I'm taking data from that, and I'm making a series of infographics and um, visualizations that are based on data about elements and nuclides and half-lives and stuff. So like cool new ways to, to kind of visualize periodic table and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's, it kind of, it comes from um, the fact that when I first joined the reactor, science and physics and mathy stuff doesn't come really naturally to me. So if I wanted to learn the material well enough to teach it, then I would need to find ways to make it make sense to me. And a lot of that is drawing pictures or making graphs and things. I work here because I'm really interested in all kinds of interdisciplinary work and I was really interested in you know, being able to have a balance between, you know, analytical scientific thinking and creativity in my academic career. The sort of research we do here, this process can be used for things like art history research, so it really is nice to get the full picture of, you know, what's going on in academics and how these different fields can still relate to each other, though, you know, art and reactors seem so far away from each other. So, so hold on, how do you use the reactor for art history research? If you have some sort of artifact, uh, say you have this ceramic shard, it will, will have trace elements in it from where the clay in it originated from. Mm -hmm. And you can, since this is a non-destructive process, you can take that shard of clay and say put it in our reactor. Okay. And then based on the elements that we discover in it, we can figure out where it came from. And that knowing where things came from is a really big part of anthropological and art history research and all those things. So you can take a shard that somebody dug up in Northern Europe and figure out that it came from Greece and somehow managed to get 600 miles away. Yep. Naturally, we had to see this process in action. We are going to irradiate a sample right here. Okay. In this facility, which is called the Rabbit. Okay. So how it works is this is a pneumatic transfer system. Right in here, there's a little uh, slot. I'm gonna put my sample right in there. I'm gonna hit that button there. This will turn on a blower and use air to shoot the sample into the reactor core while we're at power. Oh, so it's like a pneumatic tube type mm -hmm. system, like at a bank? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Except instead of taking your money and putting it in the vault or whatever, it takes it and it puts a sample in the core. It'll expose it to neutrons. There's a lot of gamma rays down in the core, but those don't really do anything to the sample. Uh, okay. It's only the neutrons that make it radioactive. Basically flip a switch, five minutes later, it will send the sample back here. And what's the sample we're gonna shoot in there today? Um, it is this. It's got some liquids in it. Uh, these are a number of different standards that we have uh, in our fume hood over there. Um, I just made a nice mix that should demonstrate, should look interesting and demonstrate sort of the NAA properties. If everything works right, we should see manganese, arsenic, and mercury. So you said NAA. What, what exactly is NAA? Uh, it's, it's neutron activation analysis. So neutrons make things radioactive. They stick to the nuclei of atoms. That makes them unstable. They need to get rid of some energy, so they decay, knock something out. When that's a gamma ray, it is unique to the element that it came from. So the... Like the energy of the gamma ray? Yeah, the energy of the gamma ray. Okay. Um, so it's unique to the element that it came from. Uh, so we can put this in a gamma spectrometer. It'll come out again, and that will tell us what was originally in the sample. So just like you can burn lithium and it burns, a, it releases a certain wavelength of light, so you can tell that it's lithium, you can do the same thing with nuclei and, and gamma, ray, gamma spectrometers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's like looking at different colors of gamma rays, if they had colors. Or, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, Rin, who's helped me out here, um, put the sample in that airlock right there. Okay. And now put my hands in these gloves, open it back up, pull the sample out, uh, we assume that that's contaminated 
just because stuff comes in. Uh, I'm gonna put it in one of these guys. Uh, these are the tubes we use to irradiate. Uh, put it in there. Grab a lid that isn't particularly corroded. Uh, yeah, so just pop it in there. Close it up. Uh, and now we're ready to push the button. Turning this on and manual out just to make sure that oh, no one left something. Okay. Before. That seems like that would be bad. Yep. Oh, can you turn it off? Here we go. Oh, I thought it would be. Maybe we have sodium. Yeah, that's my guess. All right. Uh, stand a little bit back. Okay. There Okay, so what just happened? That was more radioactive than I thought it would be. Uh, my EPD, I didn't get any dose because it wasn't very long, uh, but it alarmed saying that I was at more than two millirem. I was in a field of more than two millirem an hour. I'm not sure. That's not bad, actually. So this is what happens when you put it in the gamma spectrometer. Okay. Uh, sure. Those big, huge peaks right there are the predominant gamma ray energies okay. in the sample. Uh, it's set to count for five minutes. So this is a histogram. Uh, okay. So each of those bars is a bin full of uh, the number of gamma rays at that energy which were counted. The y-axis is number of counts. The x-axis is energy okay. going from zero to something large. Right now what we're looking at is the spectrum as it's being created. So you can see the peaks are inching slowly upwards. So. Um, when we do the final analysis later, what we'll do is we'll, uh, once it's all done counting, then we'll scroll in and we'll be looking at um, the area and things like that. But for now, what we can do is you can click on where the peaks are. And um, if you look down in the bottom, there's uh, something that says 842.65 keV. Okay. And uh, so that tells you approximately the energy of it. And then um, we have handy tables that list out uh, the peak, the isotope, the half-life, and if there's any confirmation peaks. So if um, you're uncertain about whether it's one thing or another, you can look and see what other energies the peaks will have. Each isotope has a different peak. Um, that's characteristic of the energy of the gamma radiation that it emits. So this lets, gives, lets you non-destructively figure out what exactly is in a sample. Yeah, exactly. It's really useful for that um, because I mean, a lot of the times, you know, if you're doing more chemical analysis, there's things that you have to, you know, chop, grind, dissolve, all of that sort of stuff. And so then what you wind up with at the end isn't necessarily what you originally put in. Whereas in this, uh, once we let it decay back down to background, then it's unchanged. Uh, and how long does that decay take, though? Uh, it really depends on the sample. When we do our calculations as to how long and what power and stuff we put it out, we normally control for something that will decay within a short period of time. Um, I ran some topaz over the summer, though, and that, since we put in a lot of hours on it, it took about three or four months to decay. So <laughs> took a while. But it really varies. Um, and then there are some things that, if they become radioactive, have such long half-lives that they're just not going to decay away. Like if you've got a sample with really large quantities of europium in it, uh, that has a really long half-life, like thousands upon thousands of years. Okay. So you want to be careful and always kind of know or have a good idea of what is actually in the sample because we can detect down to things that are um, anywhere between parts per billion and parts per quadrillion. Uh, so even things that you don't normally think of as being really important, <laughs> if there are a couple of atoms in there, you want to know. Yeah. So parts per quadrillion, yeah. if you're talking about something that, what, weighs a couple of grams? Yeah, less than a couple of grams. Okay, <laughs> but, but I mean, how much of, I guess it depends on what the atom is, but how much 
You're literally talking about a couple of atoms in a yeah. sample of something that weighs a couple of grams, right? Yeah, so um, kind of a cool experiment that we've done in the past is we had uh, high school kids bring in fingernail clippings from their parents' fingers. Sounds kind of weird, but... Gross. Yeah, I know, right? But um, it's a cool experiment, so you can stick them in the reactor, and uh, what you do, they become activated, and by looking at the spectrums that you get, you can tell what finger their parents wear their gold wedding rings on from the a couple of atoms of gold that wow. you can tell from the fingernail. So what my research focuses on, so like at the end, of, at the beginning of the year, I figured, well, okay, so we know how Shankar radiation is formed. So maybe if I look at the intensity and the, or the energy of the light, I should be able to work backwards and figure out uh, the energy and the number of the electrons there are. And from there, I should be able to figure out the energy of the gamma rays and the uh, energy of the fission fragments themselves that emit those gamma rays and those beta particles. From there, I should be able to figure out the uh, energy of the fission events. And from those fission events, I should be able to figure out the number and energy of the neutrons, and then thus determine the power of the reactor. But don't you already know the power of the reactor? Yeah, we already know the power of the reactor, but it's, it's, it's just interesting, it's really fascinating that just from looking at the light, you can, like, theoretically actually determine the power of the uh, like power of the reactor as well. So this is the this is a tool, it's about 25, 25 feet tall, and at the end of the tool, there's an optical fiber that goes into a container that contains a biconvex lens. So what's happening or like down there is the, the light is being like fo focused by the biconvex lens onto the optical fiber. And from there, it comes out, it goes inside this makeshift Faraday cage, okay. uh, and goes into this mon monochromator. When it goes into the monochromator, like right now it's at the end of the thesis, so everything's wrapped up. But when it goes into the monochromator, uh, I can pick up whatever like uh, like wavelength I want, and from there it goes into this amplifier because the light is pretty dim through the uh, optical fiber. From the amplifier, I can determine what voltage uh, I'm like I'm getting, or basically the energy of the, the energy of light. Yeah, okay. yeah. So th that way I can determine the uh, spectrum. Uh, that's in there, the, the visible spectrum. So there is, there's blue light, yes, but there, there, there could be some other light that, down there as well. So from looking at that spectrum, I can extract uh, like beta spectrum or the Compton like, or, or, or the Compton scattering spectrum as well. And from there, work backwards to uh, determine the number of fission fragments, energy of fission fragments, and fission events, neutron flux, and then the power of the reactor. Can you tell us a little bit about like the the program here and the reactor and kind of what the goals are? So Reed College, of course, is a liberal arts college, and the reason they have a research reactor is about diversity in education. And the reactor is used by students to thesis. It's also used by students to just run experiments. And of course, I have a lot of other colleges and universities from around the Portland area that come in for tours, including high school students and community groups. And if people want to get started and learn more about reactors, how, how can they do that? At Reed College, you would come in in the fall. Uh, we have a program that starts up in the fall. We start with about 80 students who train. Uh, they come in for a lecture once a week and a lab once a week. Uh, by November or so, we have them submit an application. Unfortunately, we can only license about 15 people a year. Uh, if we do more than that, it's just not enough time in the day to keep everybody active. So, Can you describe a little bit of what the, what the difference between a research reactor and a power generating reactor or, or like a, something used to make fissile materials for bombs, bombs and stuff like that is? So the real big difference between a research reactor and a power reactor is research reactors don't generate power. In fact, one of the things you want to do at a research reactor is make different flux shapes or flux profiles across your core. At a power reactor, that would be very unsatisfactory because you would generate less power. So when you say flux shapes, you mean the concentrations of neutrons coming out of the reactor? Right, that's the concentration of neutrons, and of course energy is related to the concentration of neutrons coming out of the reactor. And by shaping the flux, you can control things like the rabbit and make sure that the, the materials you're putting into the reactor get more radiation faster? Right, so it would get more radiation faster, or you can also, at some reactors, define what energy of neutron is actually hitting the material, and that's a very specific thing, too, to do. What kind of stuff can people find out by, by using the reactor, uh, you know, with whatever they're doing? So, some of the simple things that we've done here is if you irradiate someone's fingernails who is wearing a gold ring, you can tell which finger that was on. <laughs> uh, that can be used or extrapolated into a forensic analysis. Uh, you can use it to source pottery shards or rocks. Uh, you can also use it to do you know, any number of things for mining. You can track where you would like to dig in the mine. Uh, 
Some corporations use it to track catalyst residue. Some people use it to, uh, it makes imagery like x-rays. You can use it to look at airplane wing fatigue and things like that. So okay. they're very fascinating things to use as a tool. Hey, that was really awesome, I thought. Yeah, th that huge reactor, we're so close to it. A giant look, pool of water. Look down into a nuclear reactor. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in the Reed Reactor, then, uh, well, the classes are open to anyone. Yeah, you don't even have to be a student here. You can sit on lectures. They actually don't even get credit for taking those lectures. So they're just doing it for love of the nuclear reactor? For science. Okay, that's good. That's good. And of course, there's tours as well. There's information for that on their website. Uh, we'll put it on the bottom, but you can just Google Reed Research Reactor and it pops right up. Uh, thanks so much to Reed College and the folks at the Reed Research Reactor and, and everyone that we saw, students. The whole nine yards was fantastic. I learned a ton. Uh, we'll be back later with more tested. I'm Will. I'm Norm. See you guys. Bye. If you'd like to learn more about nuclear fission or research reactors, check Wikipedia or visit